I've been instructed on how to do this. So, namaskara. Um, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about my morning. Um, so, yes, I have come all the way from London. Um, I did arrive on Tuesday morning, actually, at 4.30 in the morning. That's an awful flight to take. You don't get to sleep because you leave at 2.30 in the afternoon and I can't sleep in the middle of the afternoon. Um, but this morning, actually, I, I, was, uh, I was woken up by my obnoxious alarm on my Android phone, of course. And I got out of bed and I hadn't had enough sleep and I still feel quite groggy and sleepy. But I picked up my phone and I swiped up to look at Google Now, check the news. I found out that a couple of my items on eBay have sold. So I was able to respond to some of the sellers or some of the buyers and tell them that we're going to dispatch the products tomorrow. I was also able to see that I was actually only 11 minutes drive from Vivex, which I visited the other day because I'm looking to buy some appliances. We're moving to Zurich. Um, yeah, only 11 minutes drive from my hotel. And it knew that because I had searched for Vivex the day before in Google Maps as I was a logged in user. It also told me that there's some wonderful sights to see near my hotel where I'm staying, which is good to know because on Saturday I have some time and I plan to visit some sites. And it showed me right in Google Now some wonderful pictures of these sites, so I was able to glance at some of them. And some of them look interesting. The Botanical Gardens is one of them. I think I'm going to go visit. And it was great. It was also able to check the news. And I learned that probably some politicians this morning or you know, maybe didn't have a very good night. <laughs> maybe they woke up to a sad day. Um, I actually think today's a, a great day and it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, Google now also told me that in order to be here on time for the presentation, I had to leave 48 minutes in advance of the presentation. So I got down to the taxi and we got in the taxi and we started to drive over here and immediately hit some traffic. So I think the 48 minute estimate was probably wrong, but it was approximate. But sitting in the traffic, I actually kind of reminded me of my upbringing and where I grew up. It's true that I live in London now. I'm obviously not from here. Um, but I grew up in Mexico, in Mexico City. And I grew up in Mexico City at a time that Mexico City was going through profound change. It was going from a city of less than 10 million people to 20 million people in only the 13 years that I did all of my schooling there. Um, so I saw, you know, and I lived a lot of the, the discomfort and the inconveniences that you're having to live here in India today. Um, I lived it firsthand. And it's actually probably the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm now part of the outreach team in emerging markets. I feel like I never got that experience out of my, out of my life. And I feel like it's really important to try to improve people's lives throughout the world. And this is what the Emerging Markets team at Google is focused on doing. So it's a pleasure to be with you here today and talk to you a little bit about what Google is doing in Emerging Markets. And it's a pleasure to actually try to inspire you uh, to think about why today is a great time to be a developer. So let me tell you a little bit about my context for this. Some years ago, early in my career, I was a developer. Well, a developer is probably a stretch in my case. I didn't study computer science, but I ended up in a small business. I started a small business consulting other small businesses on how to improve productivity. And we developed custom applications for these businesses using a database product. And this was in the early days of the web. And we did some amazing things, right? You could actually program this database to populate information from, from the customer. And it would do it really, really fast. Like if you actually posted content into a form, it would go into the database in less than three seconds. It's amazing. We actually then realized, hey, there's not really much money in doing this custom development for small businesses. They don't pay very much. And it's pretty much dependent upon the hours that you put in. It's not a leveraged business model. So we quickly figured out, hey, there's some things that some of our customers have in common. And we decided to try to develop some packaged software applications. So one of those applications was a survey tool. And we called it Simply Surveys. And it used the power of the early web. Right? 
amazing stuff, right? We, we could actually create a web interface so that you could, as the customer, you could figure out, well, what are the questions that I want to ask people? And you could create those questions online, and then you could publish your survey to the world and ask anybody to fill in the survey. And again, it was amazing, right? Those survey responses would populate in in, in seconds, right? And then on the back end, we had this script, this complicated script that would take every response and it would tabulate all the responses. And at first, we were really amazed, right? This would only take 10 seconds to tabulate these responses. And immediately after 10 seconds, present the display of all the results of, of these surveys in real time. So you could, as the customer, you could watch those results come in. It was really kind of fascinating. And eventually we got that 10 seconds down to five seconds. We did some optimization of our scripting. And eventually we got it down to even less than three seconds. And we were amazed. So we packaged this thing up and we actually had to design the packaging, the cardboard box, and spend money on that. Um, and then we had to figure out how to promote it. So we traveled around to conferences and trade shows and, and uh, put up our booths and spent money putting up the booths. And then there were catalogs in those days where you would list your software and, and successful companies like Adobe and Symantec and, and uh, some of these other sponsors that you even see at this conference you know, were heavy advertisers in these magazines. So we had to spend money on advertising to get our product noticed. And it was really costly and it was really difficult. We eventually went out of business. The product wasn't successful. I lost a bunch of money. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go work for somebody else. Right? And a couple years later, another company had the same idea. But technology had advanced. They developed a, a, a product that's now known as SurveyMonkey. Right? SurveyMonkey, just recently, about a year or two ago, raised $100 million in debt financing. They have about 200 employees. And they have about 12 million active users at any given time. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Unfortunately, my timing was not good. Today, you don't have to, you just need an idea. You don't have to have a 100 person company. You don't have to have the resources that I needed when I was trying to be successful in order to have a successful business. <coughs> oh, that was pretty exciting. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about some context. Why do I think today is a good time to be a developer? There's some amazing things happening. You've probably heard all kinds of statistics just in the couple days that you've been here. And maybe you've heard some of these, right? 1.5 million Android devices being activated every day. 1.5 million. 7.5 billion page hits per day are generated by Google's App Engine. That's only Google's App Engine. We don't power all the web pages in the world, right? 7.5 billion pages a day. Just in the Android Play Store, Google Play, which, as we all know, is not the only one. There's another one, or two or three. 25 billion apps have been downloaded from the Google Play Store. 25 billion. Even on the device front, so we're seeing massive transformation on how people are doing computing, how people are accessing the internet. Proof positive that people are now living on the internet is the fact that our Chromebook devices, which were only announced two years ago at I.O. this week, into a crowded market, right? Into a market with vendors, uh, plenty of vendors that have been selling laptop computers and desktop computers for decades into schools and into businesses, we decide there's a new kind of computing model, and we introduce Chromebooks. Chromebooks only work on the internet. There's nothing you can do with a Chromebook. There is a little bit, right? We have some offline capability, but pretty much it's a, de it's a device that is the Chrome operating system, Chrome browser that you're all familiar with, instantiated as an operating system on a device. So you can make a very inexpensive device. It boots up in seconds. Never have to do software updates. Don't have to install any antivirus. The only glitch is, I only have 10 minutes, really? You're joking. I'll speed up. Um, the only glitch is that you have to live on the internet. So proof positive that this is successful is in the, in the first full year of selling these devices, 2,000 schools in the United States alone have purchased Chromebook devices. 
Right? That might not sound a lot, but you know how slow schools are to change. Right? In Malaysia, it was recently announced, the entire country's schools have moved to Google Apps. They've moved to a virtual learning platform in Malaysia. They're all connected to the internet, and they're going to buy Chromebook devices for all their schools. They're expecting to buy millions of Chromebook devices over the years. So the landscape is totally transformed. Here in India, we've seen great examples of what this can mean to the economy. In the geospatial space alone, in India, geospatial services account for a very, very large chunk of money. It's in the, it's in the billions of, of, of dollars, if I'm not mistaken, of aggregate value. Right? Uh, there's successful companies like Meru, Meru's Cab um, Trip Tracker. Uh, Meru's Cab is actually the third largest cab company um, in the world, apparently. So, Android apps, iPhone apps, a web-based app, so you can book your cab um, directly online. Um, so there's there's great examples, I think, of of uh, of how this this economy has has transformed already, just in my lifetime. Um, and I may be older than many of you, but I'm I'm not that old. Uh, it's not uh, it's not been that that long. Google's actually quite committed to your success. So. Uh, the opportunity is big. There's a lot of opportunity for, uh, uh, for commercializing your applications. Um, and Google's quite committed to this. And we're committed to this as part of our mission, as part of the Emerging Markets mission in three ways. The first way is access. We focus on ensuring that in countries where internet access is limited, where there's not a lot of internet penetration, we can make a difference. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. The second place is in relevance. We try to make sure that we develop products that are relevant to emerging markets. So an example would be SMS Gmail. But there's other examples that I'll talk about in a minute. And the third one is sustainability. It's really important that we develop an ecosystem to support the internet adoption. And the ecosystem has multiple components. And Google is trying to make a difference in several of those components, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So let me talk about access just in a little bit more detail and give you one example. Through our Google Apps Supporting Program, we work with colleges and universities and schools around the world. And we go and we consult with them, and we find out what is their issue that's impeding them from getting students online. And if it's an access problem, we'll even provide them with some funding, matching grants, to solve their access problems. For example, in, in Morocco, uh, we funded a Wi-Fi on a campus in Morocco at the Marrakesh University. And it's a co-funding model. And the only caveat is that they agree to use Google Apps if we fund their, their Wi-Fi. We've seen it. It's very successful. Their, their internet access has, has increased. Uh, the use of Google Apps has increased noticeably. And students are having a better learning experience. We're doing this in in many other parts of the world, including India. And there's other examples on how we work in the access space. On the relevance front, I mentioned SMS. There's other examples. We recently announced Gmail in Indic languages. I think there's six languages that we're now supporting in Gmail here in India. There's also uh, recently announced Hindi input on Androids. So from your keyboard, you can, you can now type in Hindi. Um, so these are the types of things that we work on from a relevant standpoint on the Emerging Markets team. And sustainability is actually the area that my team works on. And sustainability to us is really about empowering this ecosystem. And the ecosystem has many players. We've identified several target audiences that we think are important to address. One of them would be students. So we have a Google Student Ambassador program. Here in India, we're revitalizing this program. And we're recruiting 300 student ambassadors from all over India, from colleges from all over India, from top tier colleges to the tier two cities and tier two colleges. Uh, we're recruiting student ambassadors to help evangelize the use of the internet on their campuses and create student communities. The Google Developer Groups is actually something that's been running for some time. There's more than 40 chapters in India. And if you're not already participating in one of those chapters, you should, you should look it up and go and participate. There's great ways to get involved. And recently, actually just yesterday, um, we hosted 11 chapter, uh, chapter organizers, so we call them Google Business Group Managers, um, for the Google Business Program, which is a new program, similar to Google Developer Groups, but focused on 
people that run and operate small businesses. Because the ecosystem needs both supply and demand side in order to be successful. And then there's high profile events that we do like the Big Tent events where we're trying to influence policymakers to make change in the ecosystem. So we're committed to your success. I guess the question is, are you committed to yours? There's some inspiration that I want to give you on some things that are happening in India. Uh, so I've mentioned briefly the Google Cloud Platform, which includes products like the Compute Engine and Cloud Storage. And there's wonderful examples here in India from Orangescape and Redbus. And Redbus, for instance, is, is, a, is a website where you can basically go and look up schedules of uh, any bus across India, apparently. I haven't used it, so I don't know how true their marketing is. Um, but they're actually using the cloud platform to crunch terabytes of data in seconds in order to give them insights into their business and improve customer service. There's Orangescape. Actually, the, the creator, the founder of Orangescape is one of our Google Business Group managers. Um, they recognized a need. They developed an application um, that works with Google Apps that helps customers who are migrating from Novell to Google Apps maintain workflow. Um, so they, their business model is a freemium model. They have the application in the marketplace. You can use it up to 10 users for free. And then if you want to use it for more users, you have to pay them. Um, it's a successful business. It's an India-grown business that actually is deriving most of its revenue from outside of India, from Google Apps users around the world. And there's other many great examples. Another way, another great trend is open source. And Google has contributed millions of lines of code of open source. Um, and actually, our community is contributing to that as well. So one example is, through our student ambassador program, we've been able to promote the Google Summer of Code, where for three months we work with other open source organizations and we encourage students to actually write programs on open source projects. And India actually was the largest contributor to Google Summer of Code last summer, as you can see from the chart there. Another example is Course Builder. This is a platform to offer online distance learning, blended learning. The first instance of this was the Power Search course that we did about a year ago, where in the first day, just from a blog entry, we had 140,000 people from around the world sign up. Within a month or two, about 20,000 people had completed the course and sat the exam and can call themselves certified power searchers. We took that code and we open sourced it as an open source project. And today, NPTEL is working with a collective of the top engineering universities to develop courses for all Indians to take at scale. So there's some great examples of some great ways to get involved. We hope that you want to jump in as well. Right? We hope that these inspire you to jump in and get involved. And probably as developers, the best way you can get involved is get involved with your Google developer group in your, in your local city. I don't know if you're all from Bangalore or from other parts, but there's chapters everywhere. There's many ways to get involved, as I mentioned. The Google developer groups stream live content from other events. Um, they hold online classes through the Google Developer Academy. And as I mentioned, there's many chapters to get involved in, so look it up. Sometimes the meetings are small gatherings, and sometimes they're much larger, larger gatherings. So I just want to finish. I'm going to skip the video. I just want to finish. I reflected on what I did this morning. The alarm rudely. Is there time for the video? Is that OK? All right. This could be tricky. A proud distinct nation within one proud nation. We are more than 100 languages and 1 billion people. We are deserts, snow, jungles, mountains, plains, and rivers. We are mega cities and villages. We are spiritual and scientific. We are a young nation with an ancient culture. And the blessing of being the world's biggest democracy means that we celebrate our diversity, our contradictions, and our differing points of view. But what unites us all is our hope and our optimism for the future and preparing India for its new place in the world. Less than a fifth of us are on online, but we've already started changing India for the better. Uniting and connecting through our shared values of equality, fairness and justice. Creating access to learning and opportunities for all. Preserving ancient traditions and ways of life. Allowing anyone with an idea to become an entrepreneur. Letting those with little make the most of their resources. Unleashing creativity in music and the arts. Imagine if more of us realized the power at our fingertips. 
Imagine what more we could do. Imagine what India could be. There's a great future for the internet in India. It will profoundly change the way young people think, act and behave in this country. Um, I'm reading a book recently out. You may have heard of it. Eric Schmidt's new book. Eric Schmidt's our executive chairman. He was recently in India, actually, and he talked about uh, he talked about a world where the next five billion, the remaining five billion who aren't on the internet, come online. And he talked about that happening in in the next decades, which is pretty ambiguous. I think it's inside the next two decades that that'll happen. That may be hard to believe when I go and visit, for instance, as I did the other day, Vijaya College, uh, which is a pretty Average college, I'm told, for India in terms of uh, it's a typical kind of college that people would go to. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. It's a liberal arts college. They um, they have a computer lab. They have two of them actually. I think they combined have 70 computers. And actually, to go into the computer lab, the students have to take off their shoes. I I don't know. I guess maybe because they think that that's how the computers get viruses. I I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> So some things, some things don't change. And it's hard to imagine a world where five billion people are online. I encourage you to read Eric's book. Um, it's called the, uh, A New Digital Age. And, uh, and it really, in some ways, is kind of frightening because it talks about how the world is going to change when these next five billion users come online. These five billion users, many of them, are in countries that are outright repressive. Many of them don't share the same values that we do. Many of these users come from completely different perspectives, completely different realities. And it's going to be interesting to see the voice that those people bring to the internet and actually how it changes all of our lives. So I mentioned how I was woken rudely by my alarm. Let me give you a, a picture of the future. So this is me in decades to come, when, there's, when the whole world is online. Instead of my Android phone rudely waking me up when I haven't had enough sleep, when I was in the middle of my, my deep sleep, there'll be an embedded device in my mattress that's going to detect my sleep patterns. And it's going to know when is the optimal time to wake me up so that I'm completely refreshed. And instead of the alarm going off, it's going to make my Arabica coffee from India. And the aroma is going to waft through the house. It's going to gently wake me up. Instead of having bags under my eyes, I'm going to look refreshed. And as I'm getting up, my robot's going to bring that coffee into me, right by my bed. I'm living in Zurich at this time because we're moving there in July. I'm going to have my coffee, and when I get out of bed, my hologram display is going to appear. And instead of having to pick up my phone and go through Google Now, it's going to show me the relevant news. It's going to show me who's in power in Bangalore. Because I was interested, and I looked that up yesterday. It's going to tell me in a voice-activated way. You have to present at the GIDS conference in Bangalore in two hours. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to say, my curtains are going to open. I'm going to go, and my favorite music is going to come on. Okay? I'm going to walk into the kitchen. I'm going to have my breakfast. Eventually, I'm going to make my way out to my car. It's already going to be there. Because the car is self-driven. And it knows that I have to be at work at 9 o'clock. And it knows how long it takes to get there. And I'm going to get in and I can work or not. I don't have to pay attention. It's just going to drive me there. And when I get there, I'm going to walk in. And I'm going to have another holographic display. And actually, Sunil is going to be there. Sunil looks like this in person. I have no idea what his avatar is going to look like actually never met him in person. So I'm going to talk to him. We're going to talk about the presentation. And eventually, I'm just going to connect through a hangout, a holographic hangout. And in the holographic hangout, I'm going to appear on the stage here. You might be in person, or you might also be in one of these holographic hangouts. I don't really know. And I'm going to speak to you. But instead of speaking to you in English, I'm going to be speaking fluent Hindi. Because simultaneous translation in multiple languages is going to work. And when it's over, 
I'm going to publish the survey to you in real time and you're going to take that survey and I'm going to own that company. <laughs> Finally, I will have vindicated myself and I'll have been successful. It may sound futuristic, but as I go through this, you recognize some of these technologies that I mentioned. Some of them are real. Self-driving cars, they're here. This is Google Now. That's Google Now. That's why this is a great time to be a developer. You're living in a, in a great age. And good luck with it and thank you for your time.